Um, we're going to go pretty easy today. I'm going to introduce you to the subject of microbiology. And um, the first thing that we need to discuss is what micro, what is micro? So what is micro? What, is, what does that mean, micro? Small, right? How small? Like, this is, like, I'm small compared to LeBron James. Huh? Yes, you can see it only in the light microscope or some other kind of microscope. So microbiology <clears throat> focuses mostly on things that can be seen with a microscope. And almost all microbes, well not all, but most of the microbes, can be visualized using light microscopy. Things like, like bacteria, okay, uh, even large virus like smallpox can be seen in the light microscope. Um, of course, the range is huge. The smallest viruses like polio or hepatitis D can be as small as 20 to 30 nanometers. It's about a thousand times thinner. Well, sorry. Yes, thousand times thinner than the human hair. On another end of that range would be a gigantic bacteria Thiomargarita namibiensis, which actually can be seen with the naked eye. It's about half millimeter. It's it's for bacteria. It's it's it, I cannot even tell you how big it is. It's awfully huge. Okay, and um, now most of the microbes, as I mentioned, bacteria, most of the bacteria, almost all bacteria, uh, protozoa. Fungi, algae can be seen in the light microscope. Viruses, as a general rule, cannot. You have they too small for that. You have to use electron microscopy uh, to look at them. Um, now, one you will actually find that microbiology is full of exceptions. You cannot make one. Pretty much never you can make a rule and say that is true. We have exception here, exception there. For instance, when we think about microbiology, we think about small organisms. But one of the subjects of microbiology is helminths. What are helminths? What are they? How would you call them in a different way? Helminths. Helmintic infestations. When someone has helminths. Worms, yes, it's worms. And, oh boy, they are not microscopic. For instance, Tinea saginata, Tinea solium can be, the tapeworm can be 40 feet long. Yeah, so they're pretty huge, you know. What is the reason? Why, think about it, why we talk about helminths, fungi, bacteria, viruses, all in the same course, although they are structurally different and ecologically different and have different lifestyle. Any ideas? Why specifically? Yes. Are they all caused by the same thing? They're not. They cause disease. They cause disease. Good. And they are infectious. Does that make sense? How many of you are on some kind of a medical track? nursing or something like that. We have a lot of people here, right, who do medically related stuff. And this course is focused, not entirely, but mostly focused on clinically relevant microbes. I mean, algae are hugely important in industry, but there's like one or two algal species that can cause disease in humans, so we're not going to talk about them a lot because they kind of rare. On the other hand, bacteria and viruses are hugely important for the disease, so we're going to spend a good deal of time talking about those guys. All right? Now, what are the types of microbes? I kind of <clears throat> introduced them to you, but I want to be a little bit more structured with that. So, bacteria and archaea. 
they look quiet a lot. They are prokaryotic. What does that mean? Prokaryotic. What they don't have, prokaryotes. Nucleus. They don't have nucleus. They don't have something else. No, they do. They do have cell wall. They don't have membrane bound organelles. Very good. They don't have organelles. Membrane bound organelles. Now they look very, very similar, archaea and bacteria, but it turns out they remarkably different and we'll chat about it. This illustration shows you different shapes of bacterial cells. And the initial classification of bacteria when scientists started to visualize them using microscopes was based mostly on the shape. Like cocos is the spherical. Cocos is grape in Greek. Uh, bacillus is a rod shaped. Vibrio is the curved rod. Uh, Cocobacillus is kind of in the middle. And then you have spirulum and spirochete, uh, two slightly different forms of uh, helical bacterial cells. One interesting, and let's let's go further a little bit and we'll, we'll see um, one thing. So algae, you see diatom algae here. They are eukaryotes, right? And algae that we're going to talk about briefly are unicellular. And have you ever seen unicellular algae? What do you think? Have you seen algal blooms in lakes? Like when lake starts to become green and that's algae, that's unicellular algae. On the other hand, you know, when you swim, and there's this cold, slimy thing that touches your leg and you freak out. That's multicellular algae that grows from the bottom of the pond. Okay, so they can be different. Fungi that we're going to talk about. We're going to we're going to be talking about unicellular uh, sorry unicellular fungi as well. We'll get back to protozoa. Okay, the unicellular fungi as well. But anyone does mushroom hunting? That's probably a uniquely Russian thing. Um, but you saw mushrooms. They are from the same league as fungi, but they are multicellular. They are reproductive organs of huge fungal colonies. But fungi that we're going to talk about, pathogenic ones, uh, like, like yeast, candida albicans, are unicellular fungal cells. Okay. Protozoa is quite a unique thing. It's ultimately unicellular, eukaryotic organisms. Okay? Protozoa are never multicellular. That's why we call them protozoa. Uh, do you know any protozoan cells? Protozoan species? Protozoan? I bet you heard about amoeba. That's the typical protozoa. Okay, this guy here is called Giardia lamblia. <clears throat> it's a pathogenic protozoan that uh, causes disease with a lovely name, beaver fever. You can get this disease if you drink the untreated water from pretty much any creek in the United States with beavers dwelling. Um, the fungal example would be here. It's a it's a Candida albicans, uh, the same yeast that um, causes things like thrush. Okay. Now, those were all unicellular organisms <clears throat> that we're going to focus on. But we mentioned that algae can be multicellular, right? And fungi can be. So. Now, can bacteria form multicellular organisms? I'm going to ask you why. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Terrific. They don't work together. So the difference, fundamental difference between unicellular and multicellular organisms, that in multicellular organisms there's a vast communication between cells, a lot of signaling. Okay? 
bacteria do not, they do have signaling, but not at the level multicellular organisms have. So that's fundamental difference between prokaryotic and, and, and eukaryotic organisms. Eukaryotes can form multicellular organisms, and we can see that multicellular form here is helminths. You see those two examples here. Uh, this is tinea saginata, the beef tapeworm. It can infect humans and grow in the intestines and reach a remarkable size. Uh, and this one is a fascinating um, organism called Dracunculus midinensis. It's pretty much a subcutaneous worm. It lives under the skin and um, it does cause some very unpleasant symptoms like a huge wound in the leg. Um, now it's almost eradicated, it's common in Africa. And in this picture you can see how person removes Trichunculus from the wound by rolling it on the mat. This is a, quite a tedious process. You have to be careful not to break the worm, because when you break it, the worm dies. And that's the worst that can happen. So then your immune system will start to destroy the dead worm, and it's going to hurt like hell. Okay? Uh, one of the hypotheses is that <clears throat> fiery serpents of Egypt that affected some of the Jews traveled, uh, who was who were traveling with uh, uh, Moses across the desert. There's, there's reference, fiery serpents of, of Egypt. They were referencing to the dead Dracunculus under the skin because that was really, really hurting. Um, now, viruses. Well, I have a special place for helminths in my heart. Absolutely, I love them. Well, not literally. Some dogs do have literally special place for helminths in their hearts. If you know heartworm, the dog owners. Uh, but, of course, on top of my personal list of viruses, since I was working on them for a long period of time. These guys are acellular. So they neither eukaryotes nor prokaryotes. Okay, you can see the illustration here. You can see uh, the typical coronavirus. Uh, some of the members of that, um, it's going to be family, cause diseases like SARS or MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, that you, I believe, have heard about. <clears throat> And this is a bolivars that we absolutely going to talk about. I call it a much ado about nothing virus. It was way overblown by uh, by the media. And since viruses are acellular, and this topic kind of popped up in the conversation, I want to ask you: What are the characteristics of living things? <clears throat> Come on. Let's chat. What are the characteristics? What do you think? I'm not going to take any points away. Come on. Huh? Oh, the joy killer. I was expecting this answer at the end. So this is this is relevant to Mars. Well, okay. They made of cells. Something else. Use energy, so they have metabolism. Reproduce. Yes. Evolve. Okay, so we have, we'll, we'll stop at this for cells, evolve, reproduce, have metabolism. So viruses, do they reproduce? Not in the way that we do, but bacteria don't. So they they not reproducing by division, they don't have cells. Okay. Do they evolve? Hell yeah. They don't have cells and they don't have their own energy metabolism. So those two things put viruses in the category of surprisingly non-living things. So I was deeply offended by that because I like viruses and I want them to be considered living. But... And then I uh, ran into a wonderful comparison. Does anyone do gardening? Great. 
You buy seeds. Imagine you have a packet of seeds and you put them here on the table. Seeds just sitting here on the table. What's going to happen to them? Nothing. So they by themselves. They just sitting on the table. Well, uh, they don't. Do they have metabolism? Not really. Do they replicate? N no. Well, are they made of cells? Yes, they they are made of cells. But can you consider them living? The seeds. They lack like half of the characteristics. Once you plant them, they will sprout. Right? So virus by itself, if you just have the particle and put it here, pff, nothing's going to happen to it. It's going to be sitting there until it disintegrates. You put it in the cell, it starts replicating, it hijacks the cell, it evolves, it does all those things, okay, that, that we mentioned. So one of the concepts now that is changing in microbiology is that virus, viruses should be considered to have two forms. The particle, which is essentially non-living, and the infected cell, like uh, a kind of symbiosis of virus and the cell, the unique uh, system. Okay, something to think about. Um, I couldn't find any better title for that particular part of presentation. Importance of microbes sounds really redundant. They are. Um, this first picture here shows you uh, pits of the molten tar near Los Angeles in La Brea. I don't know if you've, you've I've never seen them. I just I just read about them during thirties during the uh, prohibition. Uh, Mafia was dumping bodies in those pits. Really convenient. You know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, nobody was brave enough to dig for them, so it's perfect hiding place. Turns out, that molten tar, there are bacteria living. There are microbes. Um, you would look at, um, at the lake under the surface of Antarctic ice, two kilometers, two kilometers deep, there are microbes there that are 80 million years old. You look at the 300 degrees Celsius ocean bottom sulfur vents, there are archaea there. Microbes virtually everywhere. And in the nature, they are absolutely critical. Without uh, bacteria and fungi, we would be neck deep in animal and human courses. Okay. Because they are major decomposers. They destroy matter. And, you know, kind of switching from dead to living. Any beer lovers? Wine lovers? Cheese lovers? Bread lovers? Well, thank microbes. Without them, bread. Saccharomyces cerevisiae, <coughs> the yeast. Uh, wine and cheese and beer, it's actually a whole compendium, <clears throat> a whole compendium of bacteria and fungi and different strains that are responsible for um, specific types of, of beer and, and so on. Actually, there are studies on uh, microbial communities of breweries, how they evolve and change. From the moment the brewery is open to the moment it, it, it is operational and functional. Um, ever heard about things like when you go to the store, you buy wine. You like really wine aficionado. I'm not. But you look at this and some, some article says this year, like I know, 2009 is better than 2010 for that particular wine. Ever wondered why? What's the difference between the years, most likely? Temperature, something else. Usually same. Temp hmm? 
So yeah, well, they, they, they look for amount of sugar, but harvesting dates, temperature, amount of rain, okay? And all of this will mostly affect microbes that live on the surface of the grapes. And France spends a lot of money on studying those microbial communities to figure out maybe they can do like a starter kit, a specific standard set of microbes that will provide best quality wine. That's uh, nail polish, acetone, thanks, thanks to microbes. We produce acetone by fermentation, so they're really, really important. But <clears throat> those are industrial applications. We're not going to be talking about them a lot. We can talk about disease. Look at this four here. That's the um, bar chart from, um, what you might call it, WHO, World Health Organization. They provide the leading causes of death, as you can see, in 2012. And low respiratory tract infection, okay? Um, trachea infection, HIV, AIDS, diarrhea are all caused by different types of microbes. It's a good contribution, although, of course, heart disease and stroke dominate over it a lot. What do you think? Uh, stroke, heart disease, are they infectious? Can I infect someone? No. They're not infectious, but not contagious to be, to be exact. But turns out there are a lot of infectious diseases that increase the risk of stroke, like influenza or caries, which is also infectious disease. Actually increase the risk of stroke or heart disease. So microbes contribute to the mortality way more than you know we, we think. But death is death is bad. I don't think anybody would argue. But what sometimes is worse than death? Hmm? Yeah, we have a saying that horrible end is better than endless horror. So suffering from the disease. Often the morbidity, the symptoms, the um, incapacitation can have great impact than death. Take malaria. The yearly um, death toll from malaria, according to different estimations, from three to 500,000 people, most of them kids. Which is horrible, absolutely. The number of people that are infected, uh, something like hundreds of millions. So we talk about people who, from time to time, every three days, like they may have a period when they, every three days, they have bouts of chills, fever, muscle ache. They pretty much cannot go anywhere. They become economically inactive. So they cannot provide... Uh, for their families, and that actually, you know, puts a lot of pressure on them. Does that make sense? So that morbidity, if you would uh, add up all the morbidity, all the influence of microbial diseases in the world, um, the rhinovirus that I'm probably suffering from now, the cost for U.S. economy is in tens of billions of dollars every year because people miss work. Or they not really working and just suffering quietly. So that's that's really important. Um, what we're gonna we're gonna take a break now. Uh, we're gonna do the lab after, and we're gonna chat a little more. Okay.